Um, so this is Russ Gant, uh, and it says in his bio, he's a well-regarded, I would say very highly regarded international 3D artist, uh, computer visualization engineer, filmmaker, and educator. For more than 40 years, he's applied his visualization, visualization skills to work in computer science, archaeology, museology, uh, for some of the world's leading museums and universities. <clears throat> he comes from the Visualization Research Laboratory at Harvard, where he has a front-facing 8K 3D 120-degree uh, projection system where there's a full class, I guess what does that mean, for 20 people, high-resolution VR headset configuration. And today he's going to talk about the implications the implications of this being able to be, of being able to deliver this type of high resolution image and data visualization to the classroom and to groups of uh, science researchers. So, take it away. Sure. Um, greetings, everyone. Um, so, Sarah asked me today to sort of do a catch up. I I work a lot with the Open Doc Lab and a lot of the fellows here, so they know sort of in general what we do. But um, part of my mandate is to um, live and work five years in the future. So um, this means that you constantly have to be making these large jumps. And uh, right now, we're in the midst of one of those large jumps, trying to push um, forward. And um, looking at um, the range of visualization as it applies to teaching at the university level, um, in our case, primarily on the sciences side, but everything we do has overlap, and you'll see. Um, but also, um, we're divided between research and teaching um, research which is to say people who have a lot of high resolution data in the life sciences and uh, physics, chemistry, et cetera, they need to be able to see, visualize that data, pretty straightforward. But we're also looking at how you then teach that to active classes. And the problem there has always been that the equipment you need to properly visualize is usually limited to a single person. It's often the research computer of the lead professor or in the lab. And therefore, it's very difficult to sort of bring 20 students in and <clears throat> sort of share that research. So we've been looking at how to configure a uh, sort of science teaching area that combines the two, where a small team of researchers can come in with their data, look at it at very high resolution, uh, confer, talk, both locally and remotely. We have a lot of teleconferencing ability. But also they can bring in classes of 16 or 20 students and give a similar type of talk or presentation, but in the sort of uh, in a class format. And what's difficult about that is one, the number of people, and two, the regularity. That in what used to be, up until this semester, what was called Harvard time, um, classes started at seven minutes after the hour. That means all your technology's got to be working. Fifteen minutes later, another class comes in with a different set of requirements. It's still got to be working. It's that repeatability at this level of capability that's actually quite hard. If you've only got one research coming in for the day, you can get all set up and do it. It's not that hard. But repeat, 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 that's what's difficult. So um, I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, current work and um, where we're headed and what we've been doing this summer. Um, as I say, primarily we're looking at a wide range of standard scientific visualizations. And these can be Earth and Planetary Science, which is the department we're in, or they can be life sciences, they can be a wide range. But today, you basically cannot do almost any type of scientific research without visualization. It's really the key way that you look at this mass amounts of data that the researchers are pulling in. Everybody says it's a big data problem. It's really a visualization of big data problem. Um, we can capture the big data, we can store the big data, we can ship it around, but how do you sort through it and see it? That really turns out to be the issue. So. Um, I developed a, this research lab over at Harvard a number of years ago to initially start with the earth and planetary data and particularly structural geology, um, but we've sort of moved on from that. These are some of the capabilities we can now do in the facility. We range between 4 to 8K um, panoramic photography because we have a 120 degree screen, 4 up to 8K 3D photography, then the same with computer graphics. We can also stream or live stream video from the web um, in either 2D or 3D, ranging from 2K to 8K. We've actually been streaming 8K video over the web, which is pretty remarkable in the sense it requires a very fat bandwidth to do it. But it is possible. And you will actually go to YouTube these days, and you will see on the little gear wheel the different resolutions. It goes all the way up to 8K now. YouTube supports 8K content. Now, there's very little of it, but the system is there to push it down if you have the capability to see it. Um, the facility itself is 
based on a, a classroom which is adjacent to a big machine room. Um, we actually designed the whole facility in virtual reality um, to get the placement of all the elements and the, the humans and the machines sort of worked out. Um, but it works out that you're seating about 16 to 20 students in front of this, um, it's a 23 foot by 11 foot, 120 degree screen, um, curved. And the reason for the curbing is to increase the sense of immersion. Because really, this is where we're sort of the difference between a front-facing cave and headsets, both of which are immersive, but they're immersive in different ways. And we're very interested in the difference and the similarities between those. So when you're in the front row, this is almost your full peripheral vision. Um, so it has a tremendous um, uh, immersive capability, um, just in 2D, but when you add 3D, it becomes even greater. Um, this particular, and I'm going to jump through a number of examples, we occasionally go outside of the sciences when we find a um, program at Harvard that is advanced and needs the sort of work that we do. Here we're actually teaching French. This is third level French. Uh, and we're doing it using um, VR technology and um, immersive viewing uh, projection technology. Because we can go live um, to Paris um, in, in the room because of our teleconferencing abilities, um, and we've developed a series of um, um, teaching programs that are initially based on headsets, but, and you can see part of the class um, here is um, in headsets, um, as well as on the front screen. Um, we can show what's in the headsets on the big screen, which we often do in sort of preparation, getting people to use the headsets, what to expect, how to navigate, etc. Occasionally, we have people who just can't use headsets for various reasons, and therefore we need a supplementary display as well. Um, the French project is um, based on some work that actually began here at the Media Lab um, in the late 1970s, which is when I started it here at MIT, 78, 79, with the Aspen project, which was really one of the key things that got the whole Media Lab started, really. And this was a very simple idea, which today we call Google Street View. <laughs> Um, but at that time, it was a conceptual idea. Can you photographically move around a space, record everything that you see, put it back together in a way that you can then experience it as if you were there, including all the decision making, turn left, turn right, go in, go out, in real time. Um, this was extremely difficult in those days. It's quite easy now. Um, but what we did in Paris is um, we were shooting uh, last winter in the 11th and 12th R&D smell in Paris which is near the Place de République. And we chose that area because it's a non-tourist area of Paris. You won't see any tourists in the 11th or the 12th. Um, it's people who work there and live there. And what we were trying to do is when you're learning a language, you have this sort of plateau. The first two years are basically structural. You're learning grammar, syntax, vocabulary. But if you don't have a native speaking teacher and you're not around native speakers of the language, you quickly plateau. So in order to get off that plateau, you need to be around native speakers. So one way to do that, if you can't get on a plane and fly to the other country, is to immerse yourself in a VR experience with native speakers. So that's what we were doing here. Um, we actually filmed the daily lives of a number of different Parisians who lived in this area, and we did it over the course of a week. So this menu up there is Monday to Friday, morning to evening, um, their daily life. And it allows you in the headset to follow any of these different people. Um, through the day or jump between people because since they all live in the same place they actually intersect so they might use the same boulanger they might go to the same cafe so you might start off following one character and another character enters the scene and then you follow that other character out of the scene so it's a branching system but allows you to listen to native French it's kind of a shock to our um, third year French students that people in France particularly in Paris don't speak textbook French <laughs> um, in fact, these days it's quite polluted um, with English, with slang, with a number of other um, languages. So it's a little difficult for people to realize that they're looking for this very precise formal response and they don't get it. But that helps them learn. And so one of the things that's very important about this is that it's teaching culture alongside the language. And all your language teachers these days will tell you that you cannot separate teaching culture from language. They used to do that. They used to think they were separate things. Now they're realizing actually the cultural part is probably more important than the linguistic part. So um, this is the 11th and 12th. Um, we have in our classroom uh, full headsets. We're using the Oculus Go headsets right now. But we have several different types depending on resolution, 
whether it's three DOF controller or six DOF controller, degrees of freedom, how much you, you need for the particular content. Um, but the difficulty with running 20 headsets at once is um, you have to synchronize them for some things, like movie playback. If you're watching a film documentary, you want everybody to start, watch the movie, and stop together. Um, in this scenario, you can sort of see they're doing that here, but over here, basically they've been cut loose and they're all individually now moving through the menu. So as a result, they're all looking in different directions, they're all seeing different things, and it really changes the dynamic in the room. Um, these are live images behind them from Paris. One of the other things we've been doing is using our telecommunication ability. Um, and here we are live streaming from Paris. And we live stream um, either flat screen, we also live stream, um, live stream VR. So for example, these two people sitting on the cafe table um, with a live stream VR camera allows anyone in the audience with a headset to basically be the third person at the cafe table. So, and in real time. So now they're actually hearing a real-time conversation and able to feed back into that conversation. This was actually based on something that happened now, gee, three years ago, when we had the terrorist attacks in Paris. And um, one of those interesting things about the sort of it being the modern age is when the terrorist attacks started unfolding that night in Paris and it hit the media, everybody went into the streets. And whenever an event like this happens in Paris, the place they go is Place de République. This is where you sort of gather to share what's going on. But also what was interesting is that a lot of people had 360 cameras. There were many 360 photographers in the street while the event was unfolding. So it created this um, sort of archive of um, immersive photography. After the fact, we went back and Nicole Mills, who teaches French, set up an archive at Harvard. We gathered a lot of this material together and were able to cut it and use it to bring the students back to that moment. Um, in time. And so um, this particular cafe, La Belle Equipe, uh, was one of the um, cafes that was attacked and the owner of the cafe, uh, whose wife was actually killed in the attack, um, meets with the students and describes what happened that day in real time. So again, it has a tremendous emotional quality to it, adding to the language, adding to the culture. The students are absolutely riveted on every word that's happening because it's real, it's in real time. Um, we then switch classes, um, so for example, this we're doing an Egyptology class. A lot, uh, some of you know that I also have worked in Egypt for many years and have been involved in reconstructing a lot of Egyptian monuments in 3D and in virtual reality. So we teach a class every semester, we're teaching it right now, Mondays and Wednesdes, um, using again front projection, high res, 3D, but also headsets as well for some of our VR material. What's interesting uh, right now about this class is we're also live streaming it to China. We have a parallel class at a technical university in China who meets at the same hour, which happens to be for them 11 o'clock at night as opposed to <laughs> 11 in the morning here. Um, and um, Peter Manuelian, who teaches it, it's um, all the screen is live streamed to them as well as the audio um, as well. But we're using them because it's a technical university. They're more interested in the remote access than to particularly the content. And so we're actually doing three things during the semester. One is we're doing a, a Zoom a flat screen share, which works pretty nicely. But then we're also working on a, an avatar-based version of this. I'll get to it in a moment. Um, and then a um, live streaming VR version of the class. Um, but other classes, this is um, geology class. So same facilities, we're jumping content constantly, which is a real challenge in terms of different source computers, different applications running, all in 3D, all in high res. So um, this is the, um, the Egyptian class where we're working here with Rumi. I don't know if anybody knows the program Rumi, R-U-M-I-I. -I. It's a variation on... Um, the VR social media space, like um, high fidelity, uh, VR chat. Um, essentially the idea is you create spaces, either public or private, you can invite people into those spaces in VR and interact. And so what we wanted to do is make that a classroom rather than a party, essentially. Well, Rumi allows you to do that. It has a simulated um, school classroom environment. So what we're actually doing is in the seats here, which is in our theater, we're looking at the screen. This is what the Chinese students are seeing in their headsets sitting in a similar position in their class. So here the instructor appears as an avatar on the stage. Um, he's able to bring models 
up and float them in the air um, and talk about them and manipulate them on the virtual stage, um, which is then seen in, uh, in China. So the avatars are present. Everybody who's in a headset becomes an avatar. So anyone on this side who's in a headset appears to the Chinese students as an avatar as well. So this is another type of a way to combine um, sort of distance learning is with this shared avatar environment. And we want to know what's different from that, from the flat screen zoom, multiple screen, multiple camera. And then ultimately, as we'll see also, um, to the um, streaming VR version. So here there's a model. In this case, there's a heart out here. Um, it's been floated on the screen, and that's what everybody is seeing. This is the VR version. So using a, um, an Ozo uh, camera in the classroom, we can now do a complete 360 VR version of the class stream that back to China and put it in the headsets. So now instead of being live in the room with a bunch of avatars, you're live in the room with a bunch of real people. Um, and so we're trying to figure out what's the difference in these to the learning process, um, which communicates better. Um, is one of them better at something and another is better at something else? And how is it scalable? What if we want to put two or three hundred students in multiple locations in? Can you scale the avatar solution as well as you can the camera solution or the zoom type solution? So this is um, work that's currently underway. Um, we have a lot of other sort of activities going on. This is a virtual horse. Um, we're very interested in um, teleportion, uh, teleportation and locomotion in um, VR. How do you move around a space that's bigger than a walk around VR space um, other than teleporting? Because as soon as you hit the teleport button, you've destroyed the immersion and the illusion of reality. And the more you teleport, the less illusion of reality there is. And so you'd like to be able to move around large spaces, but not lose the immersive quality of actually seeming to walk around. Well, it turns out if you ride on something, you can do that. Um, a horse can cover a lot of ground in a short period of time. You never break the illusion of being in a real space. And also, for us who are interested in history, for the last 10,000 years, that's how people got around, was on horses. <laughs> so the entire history of the world is really tied to horse transportation. And it turns out a lot of people today are still interested in horses. Everything from gaming to horse racing to horse therapy. There's a huge group of people who are interested in horses. So virtual horses appeared in China last year um, in arcades as part of arcade games. So essentially they're using it as an arcade game uh, controller. And interestingly enough, they are a USB device. You bring out the horse, you plug it into your USB port, and you get on it, and now you can ride. Um, and they only cost about $2,000. They're relatively cheap. So it's something we're exploring and are very interested in. Um, we're doing a lot of other kind of um, use case experiences. Um, this is one of my Japanese classes. Um, here they are, um, for the first time using VR, we're very interested in first-time experience, um, and particularly cross-cultural first-time experience. Turns out that 19-year-old Japanese, 19-year-old Americans, 19-year-old French um, students don't react the same to technology and content. They have very strong cultural ways that they react. And we're trying to understand that because in our classes these days, we'll have a multitude of people from different countries in the classes. And so if you think you're targeting one group, you're maybe missing the other groups on a cultural level. So this is something that we really want to understand. Turns out that my Japanese students are natural artists, so as soon as I put them in tilt brush, I didn't have to explain anything. They just start drawing, and it's fabulous. And they say, well, can we do multiplayer drawing? Can we do this? So they immediately, but if I put them in other things, they have no concept at all of what they're supposed to do because they don't have the background in either gaming or traditional pedagogy that explains to them what they're supposed to do. So this is a very interesting thing we're looking at. Uh, we have a virtual uh, augmented reality sandbox that um, we use. I don't know if anybody's played with one. Uh, it's a very simple device. It's just a graphics projector, a box of sand, an Xbox camera that's measuring the height of the sand, and a graphics processor. But it produces a lot of very interesting teaching opportunities. We use it to teach map making, map making slope, um, a lot of intro geology stuff for first year freshmen coming in. Turns out they can't read a topographic map. Um, to start with. So we have to sort of move them in. And the best way to do that is not show them more paper, but give them something in AR and VR, and then they get it immediately. Um, this, again, a Japanese group. Um, we also have been doing teleconferencing with them, allowing them to link to other groups back in Japan, um, either seeing the same content and being able to talk about it, 
or seeing different content and talking about it. So this summer, um, we've been running a um, blended 4K system for the last several years, and I decided it was time to upgrade that projection system. So we've been going through a fairly painful process over the last several weeks of upgrading our um, 4K projectors, uh, which are actually blended 2K projectors to get four, to blended 4K projectors to get 8K resolution. Um, we have to physically demount these big projectors, mount the new ones, realign everything. Um, we've got new control systems to process all these signals that we have to handle. And then alignment. Alignment is um, really the challenge when you're using a blended projection system. Um, it seems really simple to put two projectors together. Not so simple, uh, particularly at very high resolution. Um, and so we're looking at how uh, to do that, um, but the result is that we now have ended up with an 8K image, which means that you've got about 78,000 pixels across, uh, 7,800 pixels across. Now, a standard um, 8K system um, can run anywhere from 2160 pixels in the vertical all the way down to 4096, which is a big difference, and they're still called 8K. And the reason is that the cinematic guys all do the 4096. So if you are doing the equivalent of going to an, uh, an IMAX, for example, which is a very squarish, almost vertical system, you have a lot of resolution in the vertical. Um, but if you're doing a um, sort of release cinema version, um, which are normally like 2.47 to 1 wide screen, then you've got to change that aspect ratio. Ours is 3 to 1. So actually we have a very unusual system. It's 3 to 1 aspect ratio, ratio in 8K. To my knowledge, no one else is doing that, much less with a curved screen in 3D. So we've had to face a number of challenges to make it work. But when it works, it is spectacular, um, both in terms of data display and in terms of displaying the real world. Um, and what's interesting is that the last thing we've gotten working is the 3D portion, and there is no 3D 8K content. <laughs> um, so we can't even, we have to create our own content in order to test to see if the system's even working, because we don't expect there to be any real 8K content for another two or three years out. Um, but what's fascinating is even in 2K, uh, I mean in um, 2D at 8K, nobody says anything about 3D. They're just standing there going, uh, looking at the image. Um, and it's the same reaction as to why 3D TVs went away, right? Try and go to Best Buy and, and buy a 3D TV. Nope, they're all gone. You can't buy a 3 If you didn't buy one two years ago, you cannot now buy a 3D TV, essentially. Um, and you say, well, why is that? 3D was the future. 3D is the future, right? Well, what happened is 4K came out just after 3D came out. And when you put somebody beside two monitors, a 4K 2D and a 4K 3D or a 2K 3D and say, which would you rather have? Everybody wants the 4K. They're willing to give up the 3D for the higher resolution. And there are a lot of reasons for that. One, you don't have to wear glasses. There's, um, you don't have to select your content. All content is available to you. And it turns out that most of the time you're looking at things that traditionally you've been looking at in 2D your whole life. And the idea of jumping to 3D is not comfortable. It's not actually something you want to do. Um, this is why I think there were about 60 or 65 films produced last year released in 3D in, in the United States. Only two of them were shot in 3D. The rest were all post-processed because nobody wants the 3D, essentially. They put them into limited release and the 3D dies and it stays in 2D release. So it's very interesting. We've been validating this um, experiment, as it were. Um, we're building the, um, the 4K camera, the 8K cameras out of GoPros. Uh, we've been doing that for a long time with the old 6 that you use for VR. Um, you would use the 6 camera rig. Um, but we're actually building an 8K rig in stereo <laughs> out of the GoPros because they're 4K each. So basically it's like Legos. You can just put them together and you can either do over and under or side by side um, stereo. But that's really the only way to get this high quality content except for our science sources. And that's really what this is all about, is really it's about data display. Um, because with data, it's whatever your computer can scale the data to. Um, if you're working in PyMall in the life sciences, if you're working in GoCAD in the earth sciences, if you're working in Unity or an Unreal Engine, they all scale. Um, it's only limited by your output. So the content actually will continue to scale up. And so we primarily have um, research data that we're using. 
A lot of it comes from NASA and JPL, which were the Department of Earth and Planetary Sciences. So um, we have um, a lot of data which comes into us 10K. Um, a lot of JPL and NASA data comes in from the various landers and rovers and uh, observation satellites at, uh, and vehicles, space vehicles at 10K or higher. So when we put that 10K stuff on our 8K system, it looks great. I mean, it's probably better than the guys in NASA have seen it because they don't have 8K systems either. But that's all because that type of scientific photography is based on mosaicing. That is, uh, the lunar um, land, uh, the um, Mars lander, for example, rover, will sit there and take 100 pictures around, and they'll stitch all 100 together, which creates this massive sort of um, you know, 100 gigabyte image. Um, which you can then downsample to whatever you want. And they do that regularly. They've been doing that since the 1970s, that whole process of yeah. mosaic photography, which we think of as gigapan or gigapixel images now, um, really goes back quite a ways, so over 40 years. So we have a great source of high-res data that we can use. So in that sense, we are fulfilling the needs of our customers. Um, at the same time, we're looking ahead at what else we can do with it. Um, particularly once we get our little 8K um, rig in place, we'll go out and shoot a documentary with it. And then we'll take a look at what is a documentary shot in 8K different from 4K, different from 2K. Are there fundamental elements in the quality of the image which begin to override the content or bolster the content or lower the content? Um, that's an interesting question. We see it a lot now if you're trying to go to any of these retro screenings of documentaries shot back in the 50s and 60s, and you put it up on a high-res system, and you go, wow, this stuff looks really bad. And you're looking at the whole time, it's black and white, it's grainy, it's got you know, dirt on the, the, the screen from when you transferred the film. And this is what you're thinking about while you're watching the documentary, rather than the content. Your, your brain is going, well, this is terrible. This is not, you know, and it's distracting you from the content. So this is an interesting issue, which is how to manage your content creation in a way that you are not going to constantly be falling behind display technology and therefore having your content look worse and worse and worse, which is what happens. So right now, for VR, for example, I tell people don't shoot anything less than um, about 8K in VR, even though the current headsets are 2K, because by spring the headsets will be 4K. By 18 months after that, they'll be 6K and then 8K. And your little 2K documentary is going to look terrible when you put it in the high-res systems. So the only way to future-proof what you're doing is really shoot more than you need. And you don't have to use it now. So um, was it two, three summers ago when I shot at Burning Man, we filmed in 12K. But when we put it into Premiere, we only rendered it out at 4K, which has been great for the last three years. Now, if we want to go to a high-res headset, we go back to Premiere and we hit re-render, set the, the values, and render it again. And now it comes out at 8K, and it looks great. So this is an important lesson, I think, in terms of how, when you get out of the data world into the, visuals, the sort of real-world visualization, that you see this um, need to um, outshoot the present systems. <laughs> um, and it's really not that hard, because the camera guys are marching ahead. You can, there's now uh, an 8K Theta. Does anybody use a Theta 5? Uh, the Rico, which has been 4K, been the standard. They now have an 8K version of that. Uh, who's going to use it, you would say? Well, again, it's this idea that you don't use all of it. You just use the best part of it. And the other thing is that with big resolution images, you can cut out the piece you want, essentially. Um, you can, it's almost like post-production. We'd be able to move the frame around and saying, well, gee, I wish I'd framed this shot differently. Just move it over and save that portion and throw the rest away. So um, it turns out that shooting high and showing low is really a good strategy. One thing about the comment you have with low, like there's a whole skew of people adding filters to make their stuff look old and dirty and whatever, so there's also an aesthetic, aesthetic to it, I, I mean. There is, but I would have to say that probably no one who's doing that is over 25 and or has a um, degree or has studied in uh, film, um, <laughs> right? It's the, it's the iPhone photo generation, that they're sort of rediscovering the, the whole aspect of um, um, the media creating artifacts mm. that become institutionalized as desirable. Yeah. But they can do it instantly um, mm -hmm. with new material and are exploring that medium. I don't think it has much overall impact on what 
you know, the overall flow of things. But it is an interesting observation. Um, we see it a lot, particularly in the AR world, where they're using superimposition. Um, you know, a lot of the Japanese and Korean girls, they like to put, you know, animal parts on them as they're doing their selfies and add and, you know, composite stuff onto them in real time as an AR type of thing. But again, I think that's a trend, that's a fashion. Um, what's going to happen with Snapchat and all those filters, I'm not sure. It's getting, you know, built right into the cameras, as it were, in terms of the phones. Um, hopefully, um, it quickly will become clear that those artifacts that you've introduced are actually not helping the bad content you created. <laughs> yeah, right. That's a good point. <laughs> that they're not actually making the, the overall thing better. Uh, yeah, it might be more fun, right. it might be something you want to yeah. share, it's sort of Instagrammable, but it's not actually helping your production, as yeah. it were. So, Can um, I interrupt one more thing? Or yeah, sure. Yes. So, so I also thought, you know, this is an interesting thing, because when we were doing some of the first video-based um, online documentaries back at the turn of the century, you couldn't really, like, pipe a lot of big video through the internet, so one of the ways in some of the projects I was doing with solved it was to not let the entire screen surface be taken over by video. So video would be a little, you know, square that would appear and then we would fill out the space with other stuff. And then that became an aesthetic that then design schools asked why we were doing that stuff. And, you know, and it was actually like a technical constraint. But I'm wondering if yeah. you see, like, into the future, that, you know, these screen surfaces might not be just complete the video, but there's other things going on. And yeah, it's an interesting thing. I might um, try and uh, get up a piece of another PowerPoint here to make this point. But um, yeah, th and uh, to me, this really started back in the, um, in the 90s with the emergence of the internet and the first ability to put video on the internet. And that all of it was quite small. And essentially, um, you were looking at things which were about six inches by two or three inches, something like that. And it quickly became accepted that that was okay to see even something that was originally designed for a larger screen, that you could view it, come to some kind of critical decision to, without ever going back and seeing the real thing, this acceptance of small screen imagery. And right now, it's kind of maddening. You watch people watch movies on this, even if they have in another room, 50 feet away, a bigger screen, they won't walk over, put the same thing on a bigger screen and watch it. They'll continue to watch it on a small screen, as if that was perfectly fine, that there was no reason to have the additional real estate to see the image at a larger scale. Um, and part of that, I think, is a question of separating the, the technology from the content. Um, they're saying, well, I'm watching the movie. It doesn't matter how big it is. It doesn't matter whether I can see the quality of the cinematography or these other things. I'm paying attention to the movie. Um, this is maddening to anyone who's a filmmaker or an image maker. Um, we spend a lot of time on the image and the quality of the image. And particularly marrying it to particular um, size um, venues. Um, if you're doing it on a, a theater screen in a thousand person cinema, if you're doing it in a classroom, um, these are all quite um, different things. Um, I'm going to bring up a, another PowerPoint, which is quite large and extensive, which I'm not going to do, but I'm going to try and get down to some stuff that um, has this point illustrated in it, if I can find it here. Um, because recently, my sort of favorite anti-small screen venue um, opened in, uh, in Europe, um, in Vienna, at... Um, Ars Electronica, where, I don't know, many people here know Ars Electronica as a venue for cutting-edge uh, cutting art of all kinds, but particularly imagery. Um, and they have created a new facility, which I hope is in here. Let's see here. Where? I just redid this talk, and I'm not sure where I filed these. Might be back up here a ways. That talk looks pretty interesting as well. <laughs> uh, <laughs> if you, if you, yeah, if you, haven't, if you haven't heard my 39,000-year history of VR talk, 
I do recommend it. It's, um, it really is getting at the point that none of this is new, um, that it's a continuum, and if you perceive it as new, it will throw you off considerably in understanding what is actually um, going on, um, because it indeed is not new, and it is an extension of basically... I mean, you can keep going backwards into early 20th century, you can go back into the 19th century. Um, but I begin with the caves at Lascaux as the first um, sort of truly um, human-generated immersive 3D interactive environments and how that really does change things. Yeah, okay, here we are. So let's get to here. And let's do... From current slide. Right. So, um, as we've been looking historically um, to this notion of starting with a small screen, making it bigger and bigger, gradually wrapping it around us until we had developed 360 um, theaters in the 1950s, um, this idea of increasing the screen with um, making it circular, making it immersive, really became something that was interesting to increasing audiences in cinemas. This is actually a new system that Barco is putting out and selling to theaters to add additional screens to their single front-facing rectangular screens to increase that sense of immersion. So we're going sort of backwards. We also have a trend now toward dome uh, projection and, and, and dome screens, which used to be the purview of just stars and planetariums, but are now being used for full cinematic uh, effect so that you have an entirely different way of viewing content now than you had previously. It's very immersive, you know, being underwater, of course, that's kind of redundant, but um, it provides you with this new capability. We're also seeing very strange things, like these very skinny, you know, sort of surround um, systems. Um, large, this is actually flat panel now, because instead of projection, we can tie together and tile together flat panels to make these kind of displays. But this is the one in um, Linz in Austria. Um, and this is what they call Deep Space 8K. Now, these are people, that's a screen <laughs> behind them, but also it has 8K projection on the rear screen and 8K downward projection in 3D. So the space allows you to go up on a balcony and look down or to actually sit on the downward uh, projected image. So this looks like it's big garage doors opening to the outside. That's an 8K image of the real world, floor to ceiling, 60 feet high, um, which is pretty remarkable, actually. And then, because it's downward looking as well, and 3D, you can see the um, out of focus looking image up here, everybody wears 3D glasses. So now you're essentially sitting, looking at a 3D skeleton that's you know, 60, 70 feet long. Um, here again, you can see the people floating to them, they're floating in negative space looking down at this very gigantic image. This is a whole new way of thinking about presenting stuff to large groups of people. Very high resolution, at the same time it's very large. Um, so using two 8K projectors, um, the computing power is 48 teraflops, um, and it's really a pretty, uh, pretty impressive system. Um, and they're just now beginning to experiment how to blend the, what is essentially a two-wall cave. You know, you can have two sides and a floor, two sides and a ceiling, you can have four sides, whatever, six to get a full cube. So they're looking at how to pull the image on and off and how to use this downward looking um, projection capability. Here a lecture on sunspots um, where the sun is at this enormous scale, but then you're actually lying on the sun. Um, and it's sort of, see sunspots sort of bursting up around you sort of thing. So this is a whole other level of immersion, which is really interesting, I think, um, and is a direct descendant of the traditional cave or computer-automated virtual environment, which goes back to the 1970s, um, basically 1979, where you have these separate projections um, on the different sides. And this works really well for one person, maybe two people. The problem with additional people is that the tracking for this, if it, you're tracking, can only be related to one person. So the one person is tracking for everybody else, which turns out to be a little uncomfortable, actually. 
These systems can cost upwards of half a million to a couple million dollars, which only are usable by one or two or three people at a time with very specialized content which has to be mapped into this environment. So the bang for buck, the dollar relationship is really quite poor. Uh, Brown University put one in a couple of years ago, cost them I think three million bucks, and it gets used you know, maybe 50 hours a semester. I mean, almost nothing. You can imagine if you had that kind of money, three million to put into VR with headsets at two to four hundred dollars each, you can equip an entire school with VR immersive headsets for the same amount of money. So this is an old idea which is slowly dying because of the investment that people had in it, but it really doesn't represent the sort of future. Nor does the tiling aspect of using flat panels because you've got the tiles. They just cannot get to a zero bezel on the tiling. Um, which is, of course, what leads us to headsets and you know everything that comes after. Um, so, what I just you know they say I just wanted to give you a, a, a quick run through of what um, what we're working on. Um, uh, let's see if I can. Uh, I'm just going to try and kill all this. So, actually, maybe I should go back to the other. Presentation, and let's see. Yeah, relaunch this guy. First, but mostly I wanted to see, take, some, take some questions because um, a lot of what we do is um, generates more questions than answers um, as to why we're doing it, who we're doing it for, how's it being paid for, um, what are you going to do with it, uh, where is all this headed. Um, I spend a lot of time sort of understanding what everybody else is doing as I try and find a path forward so I'm pretty aware of what else is going on in the world as it were. Um, these days without traveling. Um, used to go to a lot of trade shows, go to a lot of events and things. Now I don't go anywhere. Um, and that's all because of Shannon. Shannon's signal to noise ratio. The noise level has gotten up so high that the signal is almost zero at these events. Everybody's basically talking about their own self, what they're doing, what they're excited about. What You don't actually get any new information. And in fact, it's often confusing because you get multiple people explaining different perspectives on the same thing, none of which are probably actually true. <laughs> So basically, I've just stopped and cleared all that, and boy, it's amazing. You can think really much clearer when you're not listening to what everybody else is doing. Um, it kind of goes against the grain, but um, it seems to be working. Um, the only other thing, project that I want to mention that I didn't illustrate, which I've kind of put on hold for about four or five months, um, not only are we doing a sit-down science classroom with VR and AR, by the way, but we're also looking at a stand-up laboratory situation. If you're taking chemistry, physics, uh, microbiology, and you had to go into a lab and do your lab uh, event, um, how does that interact with the virtual world? Because there's a lot of things in a laboratory which are either dirty, dumb, or dangerous um, that you really don't want students to do um, because they can make a mistake, and that mistake has consequences. So there's a lot of things you'd like to virtualize, particularly in chemistry. Um, if A goes into B, it's fine. If B goes into A, it's not fine, uh, sort of thing. So we've been looking at how do we bring this ubiquity of the headsets into the stand-up laboratory environment. And so what I'm developing essentially is the, the virtual laboratory bench. And the bench will be divided into areas very similar to these tables, which will be your workspace. And you're going to come up to the bench, and basically there's going to be a very small computer, about the size of a, of a book, um, that's underneath the computer, that is going to be running what's on your headset. And we'll talk about that in a minute. But the idea is that you will plug in your headset and um, it's going to have an interface to it which is based on an ATM. So what I've sort of created is ATM VR, which means if you think about what computer in your life never fails, it's an ATM. It's very rare that you ever would have punched something in the ATM and it dies. Right? They run all the time. They do what they're supposed to do, which is pretty magical. Within two seconds, they know whether to give you money or not. Mm -hmm. I mean, 
you yourself probably don't even know within two seconds if you have the money, <laughs> right? So we wanted something that was incredibly stable for, for teaching. It has to scale and it has to be stable. So basically you're gonna take out your ID card, you swipe it just like you do on an ATM, a little screen comes up and says, oh, you're in Physics 101. Which lesson would you like to do today? Click lesson, boom, it's in the headset. That's it, you have no other computer interaction whatsoever. It works every single time you do it. If you're done, you hit done. It says, what do you want to do now? Lesson three, boom, it's in there, it's ready to go. And so one of the ways we're doing that is by sort of looking at what are ATM computers? Um, in fact, what are computers that never fail? What are non-fallover computers? For the military, for air traffic control, for various things where you just cannot have the system fail. I guarantee you none of them are running Windows, mm. first off. Yeah. <laughs> they said if you manage a Windows system, you know it's maddening. They will update whenever they want, they'll change things, and you just are back where you were at square one. Everything's running Unix. If you want stability, you run Unix. Because Unix has now been stable for over 40 years. So if you run old BSD standard Berkeley Unix, it's going to run every single day. There's no updates, there's no changes. Now Linux is getting more and more fragmented, and it depends on which flavor of Linux you're using. But even Linux, if you turn off everything, is very stable. And you want something that starts day one of the class, goes all semester, no changes. So it wants to be Unix. So what I've been working on is a very small Unix box, um, which will run just the virtual reality software. It doesn't do anything else in the world, just like ATMs. It can't do anything else. So it simplifies down. And what we've found is that there's a whole class of these new um, GPUs which are um, form factored to be embedded or into small computers. So your big NVIDIA cards get folded and they get to be quite small. And it turns out the biggest thing in your box is the graphics card. The actual, the rest of it, if you've ever seen a, a, a Windows Nook or any of these little stick type Windows machines, you know the, the actual computer is pretty small. It's the GPU that takes up the space. So. We're combining this so that you've got a, a very high performance GPU. It's only running one headset. Um, it can run any headset. That's the other thing, is that you don't necessarily want it to be an NVIDIA headset or a Windows uh, Mixed Reality headset. You want to plug in any headset and have it be recognized and run. And so, it turns out this is a little dedicated Unix box. Um, it has on it the courseware that you're using. Um, but it also has on it standard 3D ARBR display programs like Unity or Unreal. Unity runs under Unix, right? No problem at all. You don't even have to go out of Unity into something else. You can use the Unity player directly um, to see VR content. So no Steam, you know, no going out to, a, um, to an external engine to run this. It's all local. Well, it turns out somebody else had this idea a few years ago. It's a company called Valve, who actually runs Steam. <laughs> when they built the, the Valve or Steam OS box. It's a Unix-based little computer that's designed to be a set-top box to replace your gaming machine. And it was beginning of the idea of thin client, which is to say, let's put the majority of the processing up in the cloud, and let's just push to your screen whatever is writing on the screen at the moment. So you need very little in the local box at all. And it turns out that's a great idea, but five years ago people were like, what? It doesn't run Windows games, I don't want it, right? There's no content for it. But it's a, but it's a better solution, but there's no content. Better solution, no content. This is a standard battle we enter into. So it actually turns out Valve pulled back on the Steam OS box for a while, but it's still there, still edging along. And now it looks like they're bringing it back because the processors and the GPUs have shrunk down even more, and now they have a really excellent Windows emulator. <laughs> so now you can run all your Windows games on your Steam OS box, which is actually a Unix box. Um, but it turns out that's what we want for education, is that little Unix box. Because it only costs about $300 per student, which is actually, in many cases, less than the headset. So what we're trying to do is reverse that equation where you had a three or $400 headset and a three to $4,000 computer, which is non-scalable, non-supportable um, in a university environment. Flip that around where the computer costs less than the headset, so the headset either becomes disposable or a student-owned system. Um, they pull out their favorite headset and plug it into your box, essentially. It's sort of what you're doing with a laptop. We used to went through a period where nobody had laptops, we'd loan students laptops, and now we expect students to have their own laptops. 
And it's the same thing. We now expect them to have a smartphone, a laptop, and probably a VR headset on day one as a freshman when they arrive. So now you want a system that reacts to their peripherals. Um, and if you can have them connect to a box that's about 300 bucks each, that's scalable, particularly in a laboratory where the classes rotate through the space. So you put up 20 workstations for 6,000 um, bucks, but during the day you may run 100 students through there. Over a week, you're running 1,000 students through there. The cost differential for that two, $300 box is nothing. So then it becomes scalable. So that's another thing that we're trying to look at is how to get away from these large, expensive cave systems, which are not scalable, keep the quality and what we've learned from the kind of content and put it into a system that is scalable. So that's really part of the longer term research that we're looking at. Anything else? Questions? Yeah, I'm interested, especially in the uh, education space, what like assistive technologies might look like for this kind of interface. What kind of technology? Assistive technologies, like for visual impairments or motor. Right, yeah, yeah absolutely. Um, yeah, that's a very important area, and I had a very interesting lesson in that recently. When we were doing our French class, we actually took the headsets to the French classroom, handed them out to all the students, and they had to basically go through this exercise with the headset. Turned out one of the students was blind. And we're going, uh-oh, <laughs> what do we do with this person? And so, because it's all based on, on head tracking. So we paired them with another student who was not uh, disabled and put the earphones in the student who was, who couldn't see. And so the person moving their head, she'd say, well, what's to the left? The person would turn to the left and it's as if she was basically remote control turning her head. But what she was interested in was the sound. And it turned out that she could hear the sound way better than everybody else in the room. So she was hearing secondary conversations where the, the goal was to hear the primary conversation in the foreground. That student was actually hearing background conversations, which the other students couldn't hear. So you're absolutely right. This is something in a particular university environment where you've got a wide range of capabilities. Some people just can't do immersive headsets either. Uh, they have vestibular problems, they, have, they get motion sickness very easily or something like that. So you always need a secondary system. So one of the things that we allow in all this is a flat screen secondary look into the data. We always support a flat screen secondary view. So you can use a tablet, you can use your laptop, either locally or remotely, to see what's going on and scroll around the same way you would and get pretty much the same sort of experience. Um, but it's an, it's an important area, and um, not enough has gone into it yet. Um, we hope we keep pushing for it, but um, it's a good point. I had a couple quick questions. Mm -hmm. When you were uh, doing the live Paris streaming, what kind of, did you have a preferred camera that you were using to do uh, the live VR streaming? We used two cameras. Um, we were always trying to keep this relatively inexpensive. For the um, people who uh, we filmed, actually they filmed themselves. We brought them in, did a workshop, we gave them all Theta 5 cameras, explained how to use it, and sent them home with the camera for a month. And they actually then would post every Sunday night their, their dailies to us here in Boston. We would edit, comment, and go back to them. So we were sort of teaching them to be self-documentary photographers which was great because they shot stuff otherwise if someone else had been in the room they would have never shot <laughs> type of thing. Um, we also used for the streaming part, the Theta will stream, the Theta 5 will stream, but we also used the Views. The Views, V-U-Z-E, is a um, 4K 3D camera, it's about $800. The Theta is a $400 camera with a $300 360 mic, so they're sort of equivalent um, in a way. They both stream. Um, the views um, streams very well in 3D. The third thing we tested was our own home-built um, 4K um, GoPro rig. And the reason, um, we've built a number of rigs out of GoPros. We built a three camera rig, a six camera rig, a 12 and a 24, depending on how much resolution, whether it's 3D or not 3D. But most importantly, what you're shooting. If you're shooting uh, in 360 at all, parallax is your enemy. That is how close things are to the camera. Um, that's where you get all the stitching problems and the mm, issues of um, sort of things that don't look right in the scene. So in order to do that, you have to reduce the number of cameras. That's why the three camera GoPro comes into play. If you're on a cafe table that's only a meter in diameter, 
you got three or four people around it, and you want the camera in the center, that's below the parallax range for all these standard cameras. You need two meters at least to, to shoot with. So if you're at a meter, what do you do? Well, it turns out you can take your GoPros, pull the 120 degree lenses off of them, and there are 190 degree lenses you can put on them. <laughs> now, think about that, 190 is seeing behind you, right? So three 190s give you a full 360, but with reduced parallax issues. You can get up to 18 inches away from that camera with no parallax issues, that little three camera GoPro rig. Is that a so, GoPro, GoPro has that lens? Or? Yeah, it's, well, it's an accessory. That, um, it's just a screw-in thing. You have to realign the camera after you screw the new lens in. It costs about 100 bucks, the lenses. They're not very expensive. Um, so it's easy to, to build them. Um, so we did both, the theta and the views. The views turned out to be a little bit better. Um, the biggest problem with all streaming is Wi-Fi. <laughs> it's how much Wi-Fi you've got on both ends. Because on the sending end, you need enough Wi-Fi to pick up your signal, pass it out to the internet, and push it back to here. Here, you're going into 20 headsets. Now you need a Wi-Fi environment that's going to handle streaming live video at 4K to 20 headsets simultaneously. That's a whole different problem with Wi-Fi. That means multiple routers, and you know it's a much more complicated environment to set up. I mean, I'm sorry, just to follow up on that. The, you had the, you had an Ozo streaming too, which well, the Ozo like is streaming from the... our classroom right. in the other direction out, because I don't know if you played with the Ozo. It's a 45-pound, you know, forty-thousand-dollar camera yeah. that sits out a fire hose full of data. You, you can't even hardly record it. But in live streaming mode, it's great because you're not recording anything. You just turn it on and it just pumps beautiful. In fact, that's what it was designed for. Right? Hmm? You need a lot of bandwidth to... Well, you need to be able to push a minimum of 4K um, on your bandwidth. But that's pretty doable. But it's wired, obviously, so you don't... Yeah, exactly. There's no wire. On the capture side, it's great. And um, the um, Oso itself is mostly used these days for performance and sports. Front-facing, 180-degree live streaming. Extremely high quality, um, very reliable, but you just don't want to put it into record and then try and edit all that coming out the other end. Yeah. So we're putting that camera in the theater itself to simply replicate the experience on our end to students who are elsewhere pretending to be in our classroom. So, but you could stream it, but it's just not practical. You, know? you want something you literally put out of your pocket, you know, sit on the table, turn it on with your phone and go. Uh, we're close. When you were talking about the Ozo, you were doing this uh, kind of side-by-side -side comparison between that and the VR avatar version. Yep. Uh, do you ever cut between those during like a class? You know, we like haven't yet. We're basically trying to establish two or three classes, maybe four classes in each modality before we go to the next modality mm -hmm. um, to get enough sort of, and it's, it's mostly, and I hate to say it, but it's mostly um, anecdotal data. We are not doing active um, evaluation. This is a big problem with all this. I run 1,000 students a semester through a VR classroom with no evaluation. There is no system for evaluation. Because even evaluating one class in traditional methodologies like they do at the Graduate School of Education is weeks to get through the one 50-minute class worth of data. And we do that multiple times a day, um, continually. So this is a huge issue. We've got all this experience that's not being documented other than anecdotally by myself, my team, and by the professors. This is a real issue. I keep bringing it up, but I don't know what we can do about that, actually. Could we need a different between, process for yeah. evaluation. Could you switch between those, like a, like a TV, you know, just changing a camera, camera one, camera two, between the O's mm -hmm. and, the, and the... I wish it was that simple. Yeah, yeah. Um, however, all the things involved with um, getting that signal out of the room, over there, back into all the headsets, back again, it's like, it's pretty tough yeah. right now. Not to mention the Great Firewall of China, um, which we have to bypass because they keep killing. You can't do YouTube, you can't do, all your standard things are not available in China. So we have to constantly work around to get through the firewall to start with. Um, eventually, I think we will be able to get closer to, to doing that. Um, right now, the um, the live VR social media spaces I find particularly interesting um, because they are even themselves, uh, I think it's um, VR chat or something, they advertise, you know, 100 simultaneous live avatars. 100, you know? And that's on a good day that they can support 100 live people in the same space. Most of the time you got 20, 30 people in these, you know, these chat spaces. 
we might have to do thousands. <laughs> um, how can you do that and support it? They're just not there yet. Um, but there are things you can do in the avatar space that you can't do in the real space, for sure. Um, and that's something we're, we're trying to learn about. Um, not clear exactly how that'll play out. Um, anything else? How do you see the scalability of your classroom that you, or your lab that you currently have, like to bring it to more people? Because right now you guys are uh, basically, you're in the future. Five basically years, zero. <laughs> basically zero. It's not scalable. Yeah, it's a one of a kind yeah. research facility. That's why it's research and not something else. Um, a lot of things we've learned can be exported and reused in different ways. One of the things, for example, is we took our, um, our 20 headsets and I have a cart that will hold 30 headsets, a tablet, and two routers. Um, it has the USB feeds to all the headsets, so you can simultaneously sideload the headsets and charge them, and it's on wheels. So this cart can roll down the hall and into a room, and it's an instantly equipped VR classroom. You open up the doors, you hand out the headsets, you turn on the tablet, all the headsets appear, you can either lock them together or make them independent, choose the content, and hit go. That's scalable. Now you can actually do that multiple times. The cart with the headsets combined is $6,000. Only 6000 So that means any potential classroom, that's the investment to get one classroom. But if it's on wheels, you're handling multiple classrooms. Because right now we don't have enough content, so maybe one guy's using it in the morning, someone in the afternoon. So that's a lesson we've been learning about scalability. But the room itself, no, it's pretty, pretty unique. We have a huge investment in there and in infrastructure and back end and bandwidth. We've got, you know, 20 gigabit bandwidth, you know, in there. We've got things that you just won't have now. Three years from now, four years will be common. <laughs> but now, no, um, and, you can't. And how many hours a week is it, are those people in there right now? Uh, there are, actually. There's a, well, class just ended. Uh, there was a geology class in there from 10 to 12. Um, so every and, day. Yeah, and so when we get back, I have to, I had not, no classes this afternoon because I'm working on the 3D, the stereo part, so I'm sort of juggling between classes and moving cables and connectors and things around. Um, so, yeah, anything else? Maybe totally uh, a little bit off the side tr track, but um, do you have any, any idea why Apple is not moving more than just their Apple TV? Like, they had this promise of reinventing TV, and it was mentioned at one point. Uh, yeah, I think... Is it because they're working on something breakthrough, or is it because they just don't have anything in the pipeline? No, I think it's something else, which is that you have to sort of think about who they are as a company, that is, what do they do. Um, they're a computer company. Their job is to sell computers. And over the years, the, what makes up a computer has changed greatly. Um, today, their primary computer is this guy, right? Um, you can also buy desktop versions of this, uh, but <laughs> essentially that's what's happening, is that you basically, their whole operating system, everything is migrating to the desktop. So you'll basically have big screen phones on your desktop. So they're, they're not two different worlds. They're, they're bringing it all into one world, one operating system for mobile and stationary. Um, and the other is, how many people know that this thing runs Unix? Right? You gotta know, every Apple iPhone in the world is a Unix computer. Most people don't realize that. It never occurs to them. They think it's Apple's operating system. It's not, it's Unix. There's a layer on top of Unix, which is the, the user interface, but underneath is Unix. Sure. And that actually became, um, because Steve Jobs, next. when he left Apple the first time and started the next computer, he came here to the Media Lab and to my office across the street in E39. About every two weeks he would show up, he'd just walk in the door, um, sit on the desk and say, Russ, what's new? Show me what's new. And that's because I was working with Project Athena at the time. And Athena's job was for the very first time to have 2,000 computers on a TCIP local area network, all running Unix, um, designed for education. So we were building out everything from the security systems like Kerberos and handling just even how you, you know, handle so many thin client computers and everything. So we were basically developing Unix as the primary educational platform. That's what he wanted. So he was in there every couple of weeks harvesting what we were doing and going back and putting it into the next box which was an incredible computer. Yeah, uh, had it not been sort of progress interrupted in him going back to Apple, but when he did, he went back, and um, his very first meeting with his team when he went back was, he said, we have a new operating system. It's called Unix. 
And every product from then on has been based on Unix from Apple. And it was from that experience here at MIT that he made that, that change. And it's really been crucial to the stability of the phone. Because on the other side, where you're looking at um, Android, for example, Android's inherently unstable. Um, it's just not a stable system. So this is really something that makes this a primary system. To your question about imaging, Apple has always been interested in screen display and image display and image quality and processing text and a lot of things on screen. They still are. But they know, because of what we were saying earlier, with everybody's acceptance of this as a, um, an agreeable, acceptable display, that it's not necessary to push beyond this other than um, what they're already doing, going from LCD to OLED, upping the res of the individual screen. So these things now look absolutely fabulous. I mean, this is probably the best, one of the best screens I have other than the 8K projection system. Um, is already here in this, this device. We're still pretty constrained by that little box, right? I mean, in a lot of other ways than just well, pure images. Well, yep, and that's where image casting comes in. Mm -hmm. And this is, is AirPlay. And so AirPlay is extremely important in their world. Uh, if I'm standing here, I should be able to double-click, and that image is up on that screen. Yeah. If I walk someplace else, double-click, it's on five screens. Yeah. It's on the theater, whatever. That's their goal, yeah. is to essentially separate the display from the computer. Mm -hmm. They don't want to be in the business of making displays. They want to be in the business of making computers. They want LG and they want you know, all the, the guys in Korea and Taiwan and, um, and Japan making the displays that are then compatible as outputs to the device. And this fits into their body ecosystem, um, which they're working on. Um, so you have your computers in your pocket. You have your Apple Watch on your, your arm, which is offloading some of the capabilities up to here. But this is also, and I don't know if you understand about watch bands at Apple. The watch bands cost more than the watch. I don't know if you noticed that, but you can pay $1,000 for a watch band to put on a $300 watch. And they sell a lot of them. It's a really interesting thing. But those bands are now becoming intelligent, that the bands have capability. So what you're going to end up doing is you're going to have your, your um, iWatch 4 over here, and you're going to have a second iWatch band on this arm, which matches this one, right? Now you've got controllers. Now you've got 3D space controllers with your phone in your pocket. Wow. Now for display... You're using broadband. No, well, you're using <laughs> broadband. Yeah. Um, well, it's next generation Bluetooth yeah. um, and or Wi-Fi, we're not sure, or 5G. There's lots of options. But um, at the same time then, they're also looking at your glasses as a display. So they will be coming out with a, a set of both AR and VR switchable glasses, which are part of the same ecosystem. So now your controllers are your hands. Your glasses, using front-facing cameras, can see your hands. And they're looking at 9DOF, that is the ability individual finger movement, um, is being tracked. You've got the full motion, um, and your phone is tracking your body and your body position in space and displaying it either to a set of AR or VR glasses. That sort of completes the whole you can, Apple you ecosystem. Can adjust the transparency. That's right. You can just dial the transparency in or out on the glasses. Um, we're doing that right now in our lab using the new Vive Pro headset, which has two front-facing cameras on it. So the Vive Pro is the first true MR mixed reality headset. None of the Microsoft ones actually are. They're actually VR with tracking. They're not mixed reality. But the Vive Pro is. And you can turn on the front cameras. And I look around the room. And I can either see you, or I can see the mesh that makes up the room. Um, that's really interesting. And then I can flip into pure VR as well. Super interesting. I think that's wow. yeah. definitely the And <laughs> once you can shrink that technology down from the Vive headset down to a pair of sunglasses, then you're looking at what we will see five years from now. So Apple's in no hurry. They're making a ton of money. They're iterating very nicely. Um, they really are operating at peak efficiency in their space. But also one of the other things that Steve Jobs, I think, gets not enough credit for is supply chain management. One of the most boring concepts ever, probably. He was one of the few to really understand it in the computer industry, which is to say, if I'm going to sell 100 million of these devices, I need 100 million screens. Well, that's why he brought in Tim Cook, right? Yeah. So where are those 100 million screens going to come from? And do those 100 million screens have um, particular 
of technology in them that is only being manufactured by one or two factories. Oh, okay. Then I need to know that I'm going to buy those screens three, four years in the future. So I'm going to go to that factory. I'm going to buy 100% of the output of that factory four years in the future. Right? You know, the, the so now when the future know. catches up, he's mass producing these OLED screens and no one else can buy them because the only people manufacturing them are contracted to Apple. Yeah. And so he developed this forward-looking supply chain management, whether it was gyroscopes, whether it was screens or whatever, iPod processors or chips. Reva was first with an MP3. Oh yeah, many people had them first. They went to Samsung because Samsung was the only one who could supply a small enough hard drive, and they said to Samsung, "We'll give you a contract. We'll buy these for our iPads, but you can't sell them to anybody else for two years." Yeah. And then Reva was out of business. Yeah, basically. <laughs> so that ability to forward look supply chain management—they're still doing it today. They're designing products five years in the future, and if they don't have the plant, they'll build the plant. Mm. that will not even start operating for four years to then coincide with the launch of the new product. Nobody else was thinking like that, and still isn't, really. They're all playing catch-up uh, to that. So they have a plan. The plan is not what you probably would expect at all, because they're not the company that most people expect them to be, mm. right? Mm. Uh, they're sort of misjudging what they are as a company, I think. Um, they're doing pretty well, I think. Um, by evidence of the fact that you can't get on the subway car here in Boston and not have 50 people on the train staring at their iPhone, yeah. right? Something's going on there. Yeah. And it's not only are they staring at it, it is so addictive that it almost never leaves their hand, right? It used to be it was in your pocket, your purse, or whatever. Now it never leaves their hand. They don't want it further away than they can see it. <laughs> yeah. And I don't know what we do about that. That's a whole other social totally. issue about addiction to these, because they're so good that you can't turn it off, you can't look away. Um, yeah. so. well, moving back to the experience, I was wondering if you can share some thoughts around the process of creating these materials for the teaching uh, subjects in terms of how the teachers yeah. approach you, yeah. do you have a methodology for creating that, if they act as a client for your studio, whatever. Yeah, um, yes, and that is a very, very important question, which we learned at Athena here. Um, we had our 2,000 computers in place, we connected the whole network, um, now we had to deliver courseware. And so where was that courseware coming from? We didn't have the, uh, the program to create the courseware, we didn't have the program to distribute the courseware, we didn't have the, the, the um, program to evaluate the courseware. So those all had to be built out. We're basically in the same situation now. You don't have any subject that will run in this, um, these systems. With one good exception, and it is primarily in the sciences that we have in advance, and that is we have a lot of very good, well-established viewing programs for science data. Things like PyMol in the life sciences for looking at enzymes and molecules. Been around for 10 years, very stable. Um, so all you need is data plus the application and you have class materials because you're actually teaching in the real application that the real scientists are using. You're not pulling that out and putting it into lessons that you iterate. You actually put them in the real software, show them real data, and teach them real stuff. So that's one way to circumvent that. Um, the other is a, a single word, which is pretty interesting. I didn't really understand it until I went to Harvard. Preceptor. Do you know what a preceptor is? Preceptor. Preceptor is a person who teaches teachers. <laughs> right? That turns out to be very crucial. Because if you've got, as we do at Harvard, 20 French teachers, who know nothing about technology, but we're going to put them in using a VR or French class, they need someone to teach the technology to the teachers. That's the preceptors. And so they basically pull the teachers out, put them in a class, explain how the technology works, how the pedagogy works, how it links to their traditional paperwork and their other class materials. Then it's an easy transition. They come right in, they put their students in it, they know what to ask and what to do. Um, on the, the lowest end of the development cycle, you're actually going that backwards from graduate students to undergraduate to K-12. And so at the graduate level, you put them in real programs with real data. When you go to the undergraduate level, now you're using the preceptor to either take extracts from the real stuff and package it for the students and teach them how to use it. When you get down to K-12, now it's broken down into these very simple, simplistic modules. You can't do that. Now you need lessons, lesson plans, and steps um, that the teachers are familiar with. 
So there you need to give them a toolkit that enables the teachers to actually create, that is to take their existing materials on paper, move them over into your environment with no coding experience. There's a new set of programs designed to do that, to mediate between the two. A good example is called Wanda VR, W-O-N-D-A VR, one word, out of Paris. Um, uh, Arnaud Desson, who created Wanda, um, has this in mind, and it's a drag and drop, um, use your standard assets into a menu structure that you basically hit return, it compiles and produces a full finished VR interactive program for you. But it's only 360 video, right? It's only 360, but now it also is branching and more interactive. Um, it also, um, they're developing uh, spaces for multiple users to come in who are sharing the same program, for example. So it's building out. But the idea was you could take an average teacher, their regular syllabus, their materials, I got picture, picture, text, text, I got a quiz. Drag that right over and make it a 360 interactive video. Pretty straightforward. And only do it in a couple of hours. Uh, it's a very low learning curve for that. So you need something like that to get the lower end up. Now you can also do that at the university level. We're using it in, at Harvard for the French program. So we used Wanda for that. No programming whatsoever. We shot in January in Paris. In February we edited. And in March we ran it in the class. That, you need that like eight, nine week period from inception to delivery in the class. And that allows you to begin to do that. But that's a new, new dimension. And we're starting to see more companies now who are going into that space of assisting non-programmers to create immersive environments. Excellent. Yeah, so it makes, makes, makes things easier once they exist. Anything else? Super interesting. Yeah, thanks. You're quite welcome. Thank you, guys. Thank you. Thanks, Thank you. Russ. Um, once we finish all of our upgrades, we'll have everybody over there to look at some 8K. Um, it's pretty interesting because it is probably the plateau. There will not be a 16K because you can't see the difference. Hmm. We, we've actually... Oh, you're getting to the, just like the screens. Yeah, these guys exactly. There, you can't go any further. And we're seeing that at projection now. Um, interestingly, I can project 16K, but I have no 16K projectors. <laughs> that is, I have the capability of generating a 16K image, um, and I can project part of it and compare it with a projected 4 and 8K image. Once you get past 8K, you can't see the difference. But I guess if you're getting a huge screen, then you Yeah, sure. When, when you get below up to 23 feet, but even in a classroom with only 16 students, sure. you can't see the difference. Right. You have to literally walk up to the screen and stare at it, and you kind of go, mm, yeah, there's a pixel. Um, so practically speaking, and for the costs involved, because every time you iterate one of these jumps, you have to redo all your content in the whole world. <laughs> That's not going to happen. They even right now don't want to go to 4K. And 4K is so passe that you can now go on sale at Best Buy, buy a 55-inch 4K TV for 350 bucks. <laughs> Just right? That, that's insane, right? I mean, in terms, but there's nothing to view on it. There's no 4K to view. Mm. So no one's even thinking about 8, much less anything beyond. So it's only the cinematic guys who really care. Um, 70 millimeter IMAX is 8K. That's a one to one. Yeah. So when you do a one to one digitization of each frame of IMAX, you get a one 8K video frame. And that's why the aspect ratios are following what the cinematic guys are doing. And that's why RED has the only sort of off-the-shelf 8K cameras. It's for the cinematic guys to use, essentially. And a lot of them are using it to throw away two-thirds of the data so they can reframe after shooting. Yeah. They don't even want the whole thing. They just want to catch it all and do it in post, <laughs> essentially. So maybe you could have 16K for that purpose. And then well, multi-screen. Eventually you can, I mean, when you start thinking about physical surround environments, like these big domes or like the Ars Electronica thing, mm -hmm. where you don't, you know, it's not a, a non-traditional viewing environment, mm -hmm. then there are things you can do that are pretty spectacular. Yeah. But that bleeds over into location-based entertainment, <coughs> and essentially that's where that's going to live, is in LVE, um, where you're getting the, the void, the walk-around, five-person game VR systems, and 
the malls with all the different kind of VR horses and all that. That's all going to go into the location-based entertainment area, and that'll be just by venue, essentially. So it'd be great to come see the, the 8K. Yeah. Yeah. Well, that and also, I'm very interested as a filmmaker myself, and no one has yet gotten right the idea of a VR cinema. Mm. That is, how do you go in as a group and watch a VR movie? It, it, they, they just haven't figured it out yet. They put you in a standard chair, they put headphones on you, they push you in the corner. It's like, it's not a good experience. And so we really still haven't figured out, even if you only want to do passive 360 film viewing, What's the correct way to present it to the end user? What's the headset look like and feel like? The biggest one for me is audio, earphones. If someone puts earphones on you, they've made mistake number one because the other 16 people in the room with you are also now isolated. You can't laugh, you can't talk to someone, you can't hear their emotions. You drain all the emotion out of the movie, which is shared emotion primarily. But if you put the sound in the room and put people in the headsets, it fixes it immediately. And so now we've got um, 10 2 surround sound in the theater. And so we put people on the headsets and the sound in the room. And the sound in the room is spatial. So you hear the sound behind you, everybody turns around, <laughs> even though there's no earphones. Then you're starting to get at a true, I think, 360 cinema experience. Mm, yeah. um, and that one is still up for grabs as to how to do that. Mm. But yeah, we, we can demonstrate that and um, the difference between syncing and unsyncing uh, viewers and. Um, I mean, I'm actually quite excited about pre-programmed 360 short film viewing. That is 15 or 20 minutes in a class out of an hour, hour and a half, where you put everybody in the headset and take them on a little trip, take them on a field trip, virtually. Um, but it's pre-edited, it's controlled, um, it's part of the pedagogical structure of the class, and when it's done, you take it off and keep going. Um, that, I think, is really useful and scalable once we figure it out. So, yep. So soon... Um, there's lots going on um, here. We've got HubWeep coming up. We've got um, the uh, Hacking Arts here at MIT coming up. Um, we've got the big hackathon coming up um, in January. I uh, highly recommend everybody do something involved with the VR AR hackathon in January. Um, I created that with Scott Greenfeld of Screenwald and here at MIT and Stephen Max Patterson three years ago. It's, now the, it's the largest hackathon in the world. Um, last time we had um, 400 teams of six people each, 2,400 people competing. We had um, 70 judges, uh, two or 3,000 visitors. I mean, it's a big deal and it's a lot of fun. And it happens right upstairs in this building uh, for three days. It's, it's pretty amazing. January 20th this year. So keep that one in mind. So there's a lot of good stuff happening around town right now. So stay tuned. Thank you. Thank you.